of Donald Trump's legal team facing a very busy 24 hours ahead. Trump's lawyers are expected to appeal two decisions to remove him from the primary ballots in Colorado and in Maine. With us now to explain all of it, CNN senior legal analyst Ellie Honig at the Magic Wall. Um, really at any moment now, it could happen at any moment. Yeah. We expect the appeals, a appeal, two appeals, we'll have to wait and see. Just to step back, though, what's the landscape right now in this new year? Yeah, Phil, so the 14th Amendment, Section 3, has gone from relative constitutional obscurity to the spotlight very quickly. Let's just remind ourselves what it says. No person shall hold any office who shall have engaged in insurrection or rebellion or given aid or comfort to the enemies thereof. Seems fairly straightforward. The problem is it is being interpreted and applied very differently across the map. Let's take a look at the current status quo. These six states have rejected challenges, efforts to try to remove Trump from the ballot. Some of them are still being appealed, Arizona and West Virginia. These 11 states, we've had challenges to Trump's eligibility brought, but then withdrawn by the challengers for reasons that are varied. Now, we have, of course, now two states, Colorado and Maine, who've decided Trump is off the ballot. He committed insurrection. 14th Amendment applies. We could see appeals in the Colorado case to the U.S. Supreme Court, in the Maine case, into the Maine state-level courts at any moment. But as you can see, I mean, this map tells you all you need to know about just how much chaos there is state to state. Do we have any sense of what the... Trump's legal team's arguments will be in the appeals? Yeah, so this is a complex sort of legal question. There's a lot of different issues swirling, but let's break it down into three questions. First of all, who decides? Now, if we look at Section 5 of the 14th Amendment, it tells us that the Congress, meaning the U.S. Congress, shall have the power to enforce by appropriate legislation the provisions of this article. Trump's team will argue that means Congress, and it's not up to the states. The opponents will argue, no, states can still make their own processes to go along with Congress. If that's true, if the states do have the right to do their own processes, that brings us to the second question, by what process? How much due process is owed here? If we look, for example, at Colorado, look, these don't have to be criminal trials. That's right. the highest level of due process. But the question is, was there enough? Colorado had a five-day trial. They had some live witnesses. They had a member of Congress. They took in documents. Some of it has hearsay that wouldn't be admissible. But again, it's not a criminal trial. If we look at the main process, there was less. That was a one or two day hearing. The only witness was a law professor. The Secretary of State relied on documents, including YouTube clips. So the question is, was either of these enough due process? And then the final question is, and this one may seem a little odd, is the president an officer of the United States? I think logically you go, of course, there actually is an argument that's made sometimes that if you look at the construction of the Constitution, the president is actually separate from an officer of the United States. I think that one's a long shot, but look for that argument to be made as well. Colorado will be appealed to the Supreme Court. Yeah. Look, this seems to be a moment just screaming out for no ambiguity. Yes, this is, yet. <laughs> this is exactly why we have a Supreme Court. We have right. a massive constitutional issue. We have all sorts of unknown. We have major implications. We have inconsistency in, in how it's being applied. We're looking for two things. First, will they take the case? They don't have to take any case, but if Trump files that appeal today, they can tell us, yes or no, we're taking it. That could happen at any moment. And then, of course, if they take it, how will they rule? Let me just say this. Nobody knows. This right. is uncharted territory, so it'll be in their hands in all likelihood. Yeah, just to, to underscore that point, there is no legal precedent here. Right. There's nothing that people are kind of drafting off of to know how this ends. We can pull on various strings right. that are out there, but there is nothing on point. We're going to get brand new law when they interpret this. Fascinating and yeah. somewhat unsettling. <laughs> Ali Honig, thanks, buddy. Thanks. CNN's Zachary Cohen joins us now. And Zachary, help us understand the arguments being made in these appeals. What are the former president's chances? Yeah, Adi, first, it's really important to know that the looming political calendar really is creating a sense of urgency here. And it's one of the reasons why um, there's this mounting pressure on the U.S. Supreme Court to weigh in on this issue, this 14th Amendment issue um, that we've seen come up in Colorado and again in Maine, where they say that under the 14th Amendment, Section 3, Trump should be removed from the primary ballot uh, because he engaged in an insurrection. Now, that is already going to, I mean, the stage is set now, sorry, to go before the Supreme Court when Trump appeals this decision. He's going to ask the Supreme Court to essentially overturn the Colorado Supreme Court, state-level courts, ruling that he should be removed from that ballot. That would effectively put him back on the ballot for the primary. But, you know, the Supreme Court has to choose whether or not it wants to it wants to take up this case. Um, but at least this appeal will at least set the stage for that possibility to happen. Now, we also expect um, Trump to appeal a similar decision in Maine, where the Secretary of State there also ruled that he should be removed from the ballot. Uh, that appeal will go through state-level courts. And the 
both decisions are on hold until the courts weigh in and this gets worked out through the legal system. But listen to what Colorado's Secretary of State said yesterday when asked about the urgency of this, of this situation and the need for the courts to weigh in and weigh in quickly. I certify the names onto the ballot uh, for the presidential primary this Friday. Uh, and so we, we do hope that the court understands that presidential primaries are rapidly uh, approaching and gives us a definitive answer whether or not the former president is disqualified from the ballot. So with so much uncertainty, states asking the Supreme Court to provide some clarity. We're going to have to wait and see if they ultimately take up this issue, though. It is unprecedented. Zach Cohen, thank you. And joining us now, former Trump attorney, Tim Parlatore. Tim, we appreciate your time this morning. On the Colorado case specifically, where the appeal is expected uh, as soon as this morning to the Supreme Court, when you think through the defenses that the Trump team would put into that appeal, what do you think is their most effective at this point? Mm -hmm. I think really the most effective is that the state uh, courts don't have the power to enforce this. You know, the 14th Amendment specifically does have a clause that Congress shall have the power to enforce, and Congress has. Uh, exercise that power in multiple ways. They passed a statute, 18 U.S.C. 2383, which is, uh, they actually expanded, um, you know, the reach of the insurrectionist ban beyond uh, just, you know, the uh, previously elected officials to basically anybody uh, that would be um, barred from holding office. But that has to be done through a judicial proceeding in the federal court. Uh, and Congress has also acted through impeaching. Uh, they impeached Donald Trump for insurrection, and he was acquitted there. So this, this case has, in some ways, already been litigated uh, using the provisions that the 14th Amendment, Section 5, provided. Can I ask you about the impeachment point? Because I, I was struck over the course of the last couple of days sure. that the, there's been some signal that the Trump team is going to utilize that, maybe not just for Colorado, but also for the Jack Smith uh, indictment as well on election subversion. I guess my question is, I, I was sitting in the Senate chamber listening to Senate leader Mitch McConnell talk about how the legal process, this doesn't do anything to change the legal process that's going to come ahead. This isn't, the Senate's not going to act on this, but by all means, the courts still can. And he wasn't the only Republican to say that. Were they wrong? So my personal belief uh, on this is that while the impeachment does uh, control as regards to the 14th Amendment litigation, it does not uh, invoke double jeopardy as to criminal litigation. And so I don't think that that is going to be necessarily a winning argument uh, of a double jeopardy to bar the January 6th prosecution. Uh, but I do think that it is going to be effective uh, related to the 14th Amendment cases. It's a, an important point, particularly as we await uh, the appeal on that federal election subversion case, uh, the special counsel pushed back on Trump's claim uh, that he should have absolute immunity from criminal prosecution. It, part of the argument was he threatens to license presidents to commit crimes to remain in offense uh, in office. I guess the question here right now is, is there's not a lot of precedent here, <laughs> which is you could say that about a lot of things that are happening right now. Uh, are we in our uncharted legal right. territory or is there an argument here that they can Trump's team can actually pull on to make their point? Yeah, it's definitely uncharted territory. I think that there, you know, the idea of a blanket immunity is a little bit too broad, and I don't see the courts uh, buying that. Now, a more limited, you know, very targeted immunity for certain acts, you know, that I do be see as being uh, something that could win, but that's not something that really can be litigated at this stage. You know, they would have to go take this case to trial and show during the trial that what he was doing was within the scope of his duties as the chief executive. Yeah, and I expect that that will be one of the things that they you know, can and should present to the jury is that you know, he was acting based on the information you know, that he had, that he reasonably believed that there would be fraud and that as you know, the chief executive charged with ensuring that the laws of the United States are followed, uh, that he was pushing, you know, for investigations. And if they make that argument uh, credibly, then I think that immunity could apply at that stage, but not here. And it seems like they're on the path to making that argument, whether it's credible or not, is still to be determined. But in that defense itself, when there's a list of dozens of people who've made very clear they told the president explicitly there was no fraud or that his theories were inaccurate, uh, some have said that they felt like he acknowledged that was the case at various points. Doesn't that undercut that point? 
Sure, and that's why it's something that really does have to go to a jury. And it's the last point that you raised there about whether he acknowledged it uh, that's going to be key. And so that's when you have disputed issues of fact like that, it's not something that can be decided by a judge at a motion stage. It's something that must be presented to a jury because the juries are the arbiters of fact. It is a very busy day ahead and a very busy year ahead. Tim Prothroy, we appreciate your time as always. Thank you.